Welcome back to the Being Mother Hustler podcast. I'm your host, Kareen Mills, and I'm so super pumped. We have the amazing Barbie Haven. Welcome, Barb. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. So what we usually do is we start with talking about your childhood because I believe, and you know as a coach, right? that our childhood, they don't define us, but they definitely take us through life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what happens in our childhood shapes how, how we show up as an adult, how we treat others as an adult until we wake up one day and say, okay, it's time to control the little person inside of me mm -hmm. and tell her that we're going to be okay. So I love 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 hearing mother hustler mother hustler's childhood oh gosh where do you want me to start start wherever you need girl um well let's see i am the youngest of three siblings um i'll start with kind of the things that i think shaped me um so youngest of three siblings i'm the only girl um i think that being the only girl um, and being the youngest was a part of what shaped me. I was, um, I remember very much not being willing to be treated as a girl. Like I wanted to do what the boys were doing. So any, any time there was any talk of, well, the boys are doing this. I, there was massive pushback on my part was of, well, so can I just because they're boys doesn't mean that I can't do it. So I grew up with that sort of chip on my shoulder, I guess, if you, however you want to call it. Um, my mom rarely worked outside of the home. It, she tried a few times, but having the kids at home, it just, things would fall apart if she wasn't there. Um, and I was raised to question authority. That was something that my parents, made clear to me was that just because somebody's in charge doesn't mean they're right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I never forgot. I um, these, yeah. So these are all great, I think, great qualities for it to raise an independent woman who thinks for herself and all of those things. However, um, I also grew up in a home where with alcoholism. And if, if people have seen me speak on Roar, there's a video out there that I did on Roar and I shared a little, little bit of the story already, but um, growing up in a home with alcoholism, um, you know, I learned at a pretty young age that things were kind of unstable. Mm -hmm. um, and even though my father quit drinking when I was eight, there were definitely not, it wasn't like your happy um, Mm -hmm. dare I say, normal family, you know? So that was something that I was searching for a lot. Um, but I was definitely loved and cared for, and I never questioned that piece of things. Um, I definitely was an independent person. I had opinions. <laughs> and as I grew older, I would say that all of that sort of got swallowed up with codependency. That's the short version. Wow. Wow. Codependency. We talked yeah. about this and we had coffee, but I want mm -hmm. you to like elaborate on that because you start as, because I didn't know your childhood until now, like just like mm -hmm. game time as my listeners. So how did that like creep in your life when you were very strong as a child? Mm -hmm. um, as somebody who grew up with boys around and you have two boys too right I do so you grew up with boys and you've always been so assertive to do whatever the boys are doing mm -hmm. and sounds to me like you were raised so super independent and then, I was and then all of a sudden you use this terminology codependency which is such a, the opposite absolutely the opposite um you know I think like a lot of young women, you know, as I grew older and started to need, felt this need to fit into society, fit into the friend molds, fit into how I'm supposed to look, how I'm supposed to act. And so there was that piece of it, which, 
you know, looking back, I mean, I fit in okay. Um, I had lots of friends. I, I was on the homecoming court. Um, I was co-captain of the dance team. Um, I was a cheerleader and dance. So, you know, from the outside looking in, you would think that I didn't struggle with confidence issues and that I, that I didn't worry about what people thought and all of that kind of stuff. But I think because my home life wasn't um, the way that I thought it should be, mm-hmm. um, in order for it to be enough, then that, that sort of not enoughness just kept getting bigger and bigger. And there wasn't anybody talking to me about that. There wasn't anybody telling me that that's a normal thing to experience or teaching me the tools about how to navigate that feeling. And so I gravitated towards outward things in order to make that go away. Um, if, if you're, it's also very natural for um, children of alcoholics to grow up and sort of become various roles. And then for me, I grew up and was sort of the hero in my family. So, and there's books written about this that you can read, but one of the role, the role of a hero basically is the hero gives the parents or the alcoholics, um, the family unit, something to be proud of. Not that my parents weren't proud of my brothers or other things, but it was something that I was striving for. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's just a lot of pressure on yourself when you're feeling one way on the inside and you are externally trying to hold everything all together. And what happened was I ended up dating um, someone who from the outside looking in, you know, I was really attracted to his family and he and I had a really good friendship. um, And he also turned out to be an addict. So it just, and I married him. He's the father of my children. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's not new information. I mean, it's, it's been, it's something that I talked about on that podcast. Um, and uh-huh. I think that I don't, I know codependency exists in other realms, but for me, it's, it really started to take hold because of being in relationship with an addict. And it, I just had the roots growing up in an alcoholic home. Okay, you talk about being the hero in your family. Uh-huh. Um, how did how did you apply? Well, you didn't really intentionally do it, right? Yeah, it's it's a subconscious. You don't realize that you are rescuing. You don't realize that that's what you're doing. Do you think that subconsciously you're doing that because to like try and maybe like have your dad quit? He quit. No, he quit on his own. So he quit when I was eight. So that, that was all great. Um, And, but there's been a lot more studies and a lot more treatment of um, the relationship aspect of Mm -hmm. what happens in a family with addiction. Now they, they didn't. And I don't know what year this started happening, but I know that when I, when when my family separated, when I divorced my ex-husband, there, it wasn't just that he needed to get treatment for his addiction. It was, I got treatment for myself. I was sick, even though I wasn't using, I'm not the one who was using anything, but I got treatment for myself. I went through therapy myself and did a lot of, you know, learning how to unravel the mindset piece and live healthy, which was something I didn't, that's the codependency piece that people don't realize. It's basically losing yourself. You are, you don't know where you end and another person begins. You just Mm -hmm. don't have any boundaries and you just completely are dependent on someone else for your own identity. Wow, do you think, wow, there's a lot there. Do you think that with your subconscious hero, heroic act, Mm -hmm. whatever that is. Do you think that you kept that in your marriage? So just, you know, I think as a mom and as a woman in in a marriage, I think we strive so hard to be that glue that keeps the family. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah, I remember, um, and I was exhausted. By the way, mm -hmm. that is exhausting. That is such a hard thing to do. And it makes, it breaks my heart when I meet people now who are, um, they're just trying to do everything for everybody and they don't take care of themselves. And, and I know what that feels like. And it's so incredibly lonely and painful mm -hmm. and um, hard to do. But yeah, I think that I for sure felt an incredible responsibility to keep the family together in part because my parents did end up splitting up um, while well, they split up and got back together. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but um, I, I just, I wanted to not fail. Mm. And so I had this incredible amount of pressure that I put on myself and what it meant to be a mother. Mm. And in my, in my brain, what it meant to be what a mother was to not fail. Well, that's not a realistic expectation. Mm -hmm. because we all fail. It's, it's learning how to fail forward, right? It's learning what to do with yeah. it that really counts. Well, trying not to fail, like you said, it's isolating. It's, mm -hmm. very, it's very much of a forceful energy than like just letting it go. It's kind of like if you have a bucket of water and it has a hole and you hold it, you have to stand there and hold the thing. Right. Until you find a fix or you just let the water go. You right. Know, and walk away <laughs> and walk yeah. away from it. Well, and then you add in the element of being married to somebody who does have the disease of addiction. Uh, and I definitely am someone, I know there are lots of varying views on this, but I am the, I am a, I'm a believer that addiction is a disease. Um, because of my intimate relationship that I've seen with it, both in my family of origin and in my first marriage, um, and being witness to someone who so desperately wanted to stop and, and was having a struggle doing that. But because of that scenario, you know, I became, um, really two different people. I was, I was like one person at home. Um, and I, and I was very different in my work space. So, um, my work, my career, I started out as a legal assistant actually. And I, so I had lots of different corporate jobs. I worked for the attorney general's office. Okay. I, I want to stop you right there. Right? Yeah. Because you said something that I think exists a lot in society mm -hmm. and I, you know, want you to elaborate on living two different personalities and two different Mm -hmm. essentially identity because you have to change your identity when you got home and then mm -hmm. you had to change your identity when you got to work because we pretend life at home is fantastic and I wonder if there was a third identity where you're around your friends or you didn't have a friend because you were isolating yourself so you you can talk about that but also I want the women that may be going through this or the moms that are going mm -hmm. through this listening right now to kind of get some tips from you because now you've overcome it now uh -huh. you're on the other side and so um i mean we can talk so much about this specific I, one yeah i um it wasn't until i was really in therapy that i realized how different i was at home than i was at work and for me work was was a safe place i actually got to just be me at work Wow. Most of me with, of course, some walls up because I couldn't let people know that all the stuff was going on at home because how much, you know, shame I had in, in all of that. Yeah. So I would say you're right. There were probably three different, um, me's, <laughs> um, and really none of those three were fully myself until, um, I don't remember what year it was, but it was a friend that it was a new friend that I met that somehow miraculously I allowed her to see 100% the real me. Wow. And it was liberating because she liked me anyway. Like there was, there was, n there was no filter. She's still my best friend to this day. Like there is, there was no filter. No judgment. No that. judgment. I, I have never, not once have I ever felt like she was judging me or, or, um, which 
I have to say, when we have those kinds of experiences, it tends to be ourselves, not the other person. We, we take that on, um, the judgment piece. But I think you're right. I, I had different, three different um, me's going on. At home, I didn't, I just didn't know how to speak up. I had no voice wow. at all. Well, that's another exhausting part too, is being like stepping into a different identity in everywhere you go. You know, mm -hmm. like, not only that you were alone, but you had to, you were alone with your three different identities, which is right. like only one person. Right. Oh. Yeah. It, and it was, you know, I, I got really, really good at putting on the way I like to describe it is putting on whatever mask I needed to put on for whatever situation I was in. There was very, very, very rare was it that I was just me and raw and vulnerable. I was kind of always on. In fact, I remember as I was um, starting to get healthy and the way that I did that, you, you wanted me to share a little bit like some tips on how I did that was I didn't do it alone. There's that. <laughs> I just, um, I couldn't do it alone. Not anymore. No, no. I mean, it was just too painful to do alone. Um, but as I started to um, just kind of take off the masks and become more of who I was, um, it just got a little bit easier to do that. Um, and I did it with help. So, I mean, I, I'm not, I am, I am not ashamed to say that I spent, four years in therapy yeah kudos to you girl i think a lot of the the people that may be listening to this that have gone through or or go through or going through what you're what you have gone through mm -hmm. is that it's hard for us especially moms and women in general to ask for help and we because mm -hmm. we think we're like these bad asses that we can just do it all right mm -hmm. so that's one of the hardest thing that i personally also had to learn um and like i just keep telling myself you know i can do it i can do it you know because we try to prove it to our own selves too because we're harsh on ourselves right but we can't and the minute that you say that and you embrace that it's just so liberating and freeing like you said I hadn't experienced any sort of personal development at all up until the point that I um, sought a counselor, which by the way, I didn't seek him out for me. I sought him out to help me wow. give me the answer to fix, fix the problem that I was having in my marriage with my husband. I did not start out by going to him for myself. Um, thankfully that is what did end up happening. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the, the getting the help piece takes, I don't know, I, I don't know that I would have done it the same had I not have children because I, like I said, I felt an incredible responsibility um, to the, the, as a mom, right, to raise a healthy family and all of that. Um, and I did things for my kids that I somehow wasn't able to do for myself even dating back to when my first was eight months old and quitting a job that was not a good fit for me and was toxic on a lot of levels. And it was toxic for months before I quit. And it took being a mom and realizing like, I have to do this for my kid so that my kid has a healthy mom. Yes, girl, you have, you have to, it's hard, but we really put our kids through these difficult situations. We think that, um, and I know this because I saw my mom do it and I understand why she did it because she did it for us. Uh -huh. And we think that um, as a mom that we're doing our kids a favor because we're keeping the family unit together. Uh -huh. But it really doesn't because like for me, I, I, you know, used to cry a lot when I talk about it, but I don't like I've healed from it. I still cry a little bit here and there, but it's so traumatic, you know, like as a child, you could still go back to that moment, uh -huh. you know, like domestic violence and your mom, like just wrestling with your dad. And, you know, it's, um, and like, had I, I mean, I'm thankful for everything. Like I can never discount adversities because sometimes those were, the reason that I became who I am today. Exactly. And so 
it, but it just creates that a lot of drama within and, and it messes us up until we're, you know, we're healed from it. And I always say we're, I don't think we're ever going to be healed from it a hundred percent. I think that it is a, a, a part of us as a compass because I think it makes us have compassion and understand mm -hmm. other people that may be going through that and relate to other people. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've had conversations, for, I've had conversations with people who have gone through or are going through what I've been through. And I'm at, with the amount of healing and training and deep intensive workshops and life coach training and all this stuff that I've done it, so every once in a while, I will get taken off guard when, when I'm sharing a personal story of something that I've gone through so that I can explain, you know, so I can empathize with somebody and let them know I've been there. And it just, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, it takes me right back. Like I'm right there in it. And it's like, wow. <laughs> It's, it's like a movie in your mind, like like a one second movie, like everything just flashes, you know? Yeah, and you just remember all like, like all of the feelings and all of the sadness and all of the emotion. Um, you know, thankfully I have a lot of the tools now to shift myself out of that space. Yes. Um, and, um, and I don't stay there for very long, but um, I don't know what I would do with, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of people out there that don't have any tools, that aren't really seeking them, don't really understand that personal development is not for people who are broken because nobody's really broken. There's that perception, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's really just a chance for you to, to grow your mind. Yeah. yeah. It's so true. So when did Barb, or Barbie come Barbie. out of all that? Um, Barbie came out of that, and I have an interesting story um, about Barb versus Barbie, if you'd like to hear it. <laughs> I would love to hear <laughs> You want me to tell you that first? Because yeah, it, sure. Okay, um, so Barbie was sort of born out of this struggle. Um, mm -hmm. I, and, and as I, became more myself and around friends who really knew the real me. And my, this is like, my friends were starting to call me this and it was became part of my identity and I liked it. The only problem was that in my, in my day job um, forever and ever and ever. And also of course, growing up, a lot of people called me Barb, which I never really have liked. Um, and so I was at this personal development nine day intensive workshop and it was day one and you know there are maybe 75 people in my cohort and we had to um we were asked to stand up and give our intention for being there and introduce ourselves and i had this little mini panic attack like oh my gosh i'm have to say who i am who am i my barbie my barbie my barbie and barbie like it was this real struggle over like who i am and I just decided in that moment that I get to choose. I get to choose. And I chose Barbie. And so from that point on, um, I started just introducing myself as that. And I still have people who refuse to call me that. That's okay. Um, and I'm working and I, I've come a long way in letting go of the, the negative self-talk that happens when I hear Barb because there is a fair amount of baggage that comes with that name, um, self-imposed, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's well, I, I want to take you back to the anxiety moment. Like you get to use uh -huh. it super powerful when you say, I decided, and it was just like a split of a second. It was mm -hmm. like a light switch that turned on in your brain. It's like, I get to choose now. I have the power to do this. Yeah. You can apply. That's like a small, I mean, it's not small for you because it's such a huge, maybe like a feat for you, but it's such a small decision that you had a really hard time making. Uh -huh. And as you made it, it's like you release the barb and here comes Barbie. <laughs> I have a hard time deciding what soft drink to order. I literally would not be able to order until 
like I just I I couldn't that's part of that's part of the um my belief as part of codependency and sort of losing yourself and you don't really know who you are and you don't know who you are you don't know who you are if you're so dependent on other people to tell you that you're okay then it's hard for you to make any decisions and so as I was practicing um learning how to stand up for myself and learning how to, to speak for me yeah that that moment was really powerful in my own story um and the weekend of course was incredibly powerful um the that that intensive training was one that i in particular chose with the intent to um get rid of the not good enough feeling like i just wanted it to go away and just to get rid of it and that's not really what happened um and i later learned that that's not something that is ever going to go away it's really something that you learn how to embrace and manage and make friends with and it's just your ego and and don't give it as much power as, as you do but yeah deciding that was you know really that's how anything that i've done in my life i've just decided and once I make that decision, I don't generally look back. Yeah, but you can apply it in, in a lot of things. You know? mm -hmm. That small little window of you making that rushing that into that decision and actually making the right decision, because obviously Barb is probably or was probably your one of your identities that we talked mm -hmm. about. And then Barbie became the real you and you yeah i would i would say that's uh, that's accurate which is why i have um the reaction or i try not to have a reaction to to bar but it is the reason why it, it brings that up for me because it's it's um it represents a time in my life where i didn't feel very empowered i didn't feel empowered as a person i didn't feel empowered as as a woman i didn't feel empowered as a wife and Barbie represents um, just really becoming me and allowing myself to just be fully present and not worry so much about judgment. Or it was always, it's always been you. But you it just has never, always been me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've never really unleashed it because sometimes we suppress a lot of things. Right. In our feelings and our emotions and all that stuff, you know? Yep. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting that people need to change their name in order to own their power. Um, it just was something that I actually liked, and um, and I just figure, why not? And it's fun, and I wanted that more fun side of me. Um, you know, if my closest girlfriends are calling me that, then it's it's a good sign. It, I think Barbie suits you a lot better than Barb, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm glad I know the difference. And that's a great story, actually. And there's a lot of nuggets in that story, you know, as, as little as that story. And it might be something that you not share a lot, as little as that part of your journey. It, it mm -hmm. actually has a lot of defining moment for you. It did. Yeah. So share it more. I love it. I love that story. <laughs> so when did you feel empowered? Did you feel empowered on that? deep work that you went to on a weekend or a nine day deep work life coaching I, or i think it came in increments you know i just continued mm -hmm. when i when i started getting a taste of what it felt like to know myself then i just became super addicted to the high of knowing more about me oh this is what happens when i think this way oh this is what happens when that happens and oh isn't that interesting like I just got super curious about why I do the things that I do and really fell in love with understanding who I am and what makes me tick and then of course come coming with that is like in that moment was the awareness that I get to decide so I think that when I felt empowered I mean, it just kind of happened over over time, um, and that was a defining moment at the beginning of that. Wow. So did it, ha like you said, it's like an incremental? Mm-hmm. I think wow. it just, it just kept getting, yeah, 
Yeah, incremental in that that it's just since that time, which I think was around 2009 or 10, maybe, um, I've just become, you know, the older I get and the, the more I take in and the, yeah, the yeah. more I do. And Was it during your four year um, of therapy or do you think it's, it's after when you, or was the coaching like becoming a life coach was during therapy? Coaching actually happened after therapy, after divorce. Um, so the therapy was really more like two years of, of therapy to sort of unravel the codependency happening in my marriage and get me to a place where I could actually make a decision about whether or not I wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, was, I felt really proud about that because I didn't want it to be just a, I'm leaving, just, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then the two years after that were all about me unraveling my childhood, talking about things, you know, that happened while I was growing up. Um, I forgot your question. Well, I think that's so important though. When you, when you actually like got super duper empowered, this was it through your life coaching experience or through the, um, through your therapy, but I think I like how you separated the two with the therapy mm -hmm. years of learning your situation and what, mm -hmm. it and then another two years of learning about yourself. And I think mm -hmm. that listening to your story, if we have to cut the learning curve of a lot of women that might be going through that, I think the best way is to go straight to getting to know who you are. Absolutely. And not waste your time of getting to know this whole entire situation that you're a part of. True. Because the minute that we get to know who we are, we get to know what we really want and it solves all the problems that you right. are having within that situation. Not the, not everything, not all the problems, but it clears, it gives you a lot more clarity. I think. Yeah. It clears the path for you to make empowered decisions. Once you become self-aware, um, I just had a lot of baggage that I needed to unpack before I could get to that spot or before I got to that spot. Maybe, maybe, maybe I could have become super self-aware and not needed as much therapy as I had. Um, but I was really loving the support that I was getting. And I was also, you know, newly single mom or about to be newly single mom going through divorce. My dad ended up in the hospital and he ended up, up passing away. Like there were so many things happening at the same time that having that support system in place was really imperative for me. Wow. So you're a mom now. I'm a mom now. And, and oh, I actually- like You're a mom. Like you're almost an empty nester. <laughs> empty nester. I have to tell you, like I did a live today on my Instagram and, um, and it's been such a weird thing because I, I didn't experience this with my firstborn, this almost empty nester because he, he went to live with his dad when he was a freshman in high school. So I already sort of experienced the, the sadness that comes with, you know, them going away or whatever. It was in a different sort of a setting, mm -hmm. um, but this is different. My son is moving to Florida at the end of this month and it was a surprise that it's happening. And I am like one minute I'm fine. The next day I'm a wreck. Like, I'm like, is this normal? Is this what it's supposed to feel like? Um, I'm like self coaching myself to, you know, either allow myself to feel the feelings and cry or, or, you know, pull myself together and remind myself that this is just another part of the chapter and, and he gets to, and I'm, you know, he gets to go explore and do his thing. It's just been fun and crazy. Is he moving there for a job or what's he moving there? Well, his dad lives in Florida um, and dad and stepmom. And so it's an opportunity for him to be in a different place. Mm -hmm. to um, be closer to the music scene that he's really passionate about mm -hmm. um, and to have the support system there to do it, um, to get out of his comfort zone. He, he's been, you know, telling me that he feels a little bit complacent here um, and wants to, you know, ultimately go down, to, go to school down there. Um, so it's, awesome. it's all good things. Um, you know, there's a silver lining in everything, I believe. And the silver lining in this, 
aside from everything I just told you about, you know, the opportunities that he has, um, is his room here in our house is ginormous. It's huge. Um, and I'm turning it into a fitness studio. So <laughs> <laughs> good for you, mama. What's your son's name? Um, Colin is my, so I have two bio children and three stepchildren. So, um, my two bio children are Colin, um, who is 22 and Mason, who will be 19 on Sunday. He's almost 19. Yeah. So that's crazy. And then, um, Brooke and Brendan and Wesley are my stepchildren who aren't really children. Um, well, <laughs> Wesley is almost 15, so he counts as a child. Wow. Wow, you're busy. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're about to be empty nester, so you're going to be busy with Barbie and husband. Yeah, to... you know, I'm busy. I'm busy coaching and growing a team of coaches and helping people, women mostly, you know, feel, feel great and get fit. And um, w one of the things that I love about being a coach is helping women take care of themselves in ways that I didn't when I was a mom, a younger mom, you know? Uh -huh. And so I love that I get to do that and help them find a way to love themselves enough to put themselves first. Um, and then just watching the transformation that comes with that is incredible. That's awesome. Is your mom still alive? She is. My mom is still alive and she actually lives in Texas um, with, um, well, not with my brother, but she's down the road from my brother. She has a house in Texas. I got to go visit her for the first time a couple months ago. Um, yeah, and she's, she's grown a lot over the last year or so, I would say. Getting out of you, what is the um, one lesson that you, you learn from your mom or dad that you apply as, as a parent that mm. they parented you with? You know, I learned a lot, actually. Um, it's no surprise that I am a health conscious person. Um, my mom was always a health conscious person. Um, and she, you know, she struggled with her weight a lot in her own life and didn't want to pass that down to us. So one of the rules that we had as children was um, we could get any cereal at all that we wanted on the cereal aisle as long as the first three ingredients weren't sugar. Wow. And that eliminates 95 to 98% of the sugar of the cereals that are on the market. So um, that is something that I pass down to my kids, um, that sort of health minded, paying attention sort of thing. Um, the, the questioning authority, I think that one came from my dad. Um, mm -hmm. And I really liked that, you know, and while he wanted to protect me as his baby girl, he also was letting me know that I could do the things that the boys could do. So the pushback was partly because he taught me to do that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's something I think he could be proud of. Um, but there is a message that um, my mom said to me that I've never forgotten. And I think it, it, I think I took it a little bit too far and I've had to sort of dial it back a little bit um, and, reframe my thinking around what she meant but um I think I was about 12 and she was in a period of her life where I think that the relationship with my dad was probably a little bit more of a struggle um even though he was sober and um so you know on those on that account things were going going well but um I just remember her kind of looking at me um as she was taking Food out of the oven and she said with a pretty stern voice never depend on a man to take care of you wow and um that was something that really struck a chord with me and that I carried with me for a long long time actually um probably to a fault and have since had to dial it back to it's okay to be in partnership with a man and care for each other it doesn't mean you you can't accept help what it means is don't lose yourself i think is really what she meant yeah. Yeah. it's amazing the little things that our mother either tell us or show us because uh -huh. you, you were told it 
for me, it was me watching my mom and, and it, I took it as I will never, ever have no options like my mom. Right. You right. Know? And cause my mom never, like we were never like we getting advice from our parents. We get to be sat down with our parents. Like it was, they were never a parent this kind of thing because they were so busy with their troubles, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. My mom had six kids. So like she was only doing her best and trying to find money and hustle for money to feed all of us. And like she had owned this little market tape, like table at the market selling chicken. And then at the end of the day, my dad steals her, her money to go gamble. So she would go sell cigarettes at night at the gambling place where my dad gambles. Like she was never around. And so we were like being parented by, of course, my dad was never around period. Um, and there was never those talk, right? Like we were never told, but it, we were always observing it. And it's like, I never, right. I always took that as like, I will, okay. The bad part is, like I said, I'll never marry a Filipino man because I don't want to be married to somebody. Else. I think I heard you say that before. And it's like this like, generalization yeah. of all these men because there are good, mm -hmm. great Filipino men. And, mm -hmm. But it's that thing that you kind of just get from growing up and it's, it sticks around for a freaking long time until you, you figure it out, you know. And I think, I think that as moms, we have the... Um, privilege and responsibility to change the message, right, that we got growing up or, um, or to break the cycle. I know for me, one of the reasons why I wanted to end the marriage to my first husband was because it was a cycle of addiction that I had realized was happening in my family. And I just didn't want it to, I didn't want to pass it down to my children. I didn't want that I, it just needed to stop. And if it took, if it meant ending the marriage for it to stop, then that's what needed to happen. Um, yeah, I think sometimes too, that's our comfort zone without even knowing, you know, sure. like you're comfortable with that. And so you grew up with that and then mm -hmm. you gravitate towards that again when you mm -hmm. write your next chapter, because that's like, I know it's not comfortable, comfortable, but I'm saying like subconsciously, yeah, it feels like home, right? It's Absolutely. So. Yeah. The discomfort in the unknown um, is something that I had to learn how to fall in love with. I had to learn how to be okay in that space um, and just learn that it it's not the end of the world. Like that's actually, and I would say over the last probably even just 18 months really is where I really have allowed myself to play in that space. And, um, and it feels like freedom. Mm -hmm. It feels like freedom. What is your message to your mom? If she was to listen to this? Mm, I love my mom. She's, um, we all do. I do. Gosh, I would say, um, she's such a good person. She's, she has such a big heart. I think um, one of the things, and this is sort of kind of going back, but I guess the message would be that I know that this, that she did everything that she knew how to do. And growing up, even though as moms, we often fall short of what our children need. Mm -hmm. And I, and I say that because um and maybe this is for the moms who are more or less in relationships with addicts. I don't know. I just know that when I was in it, um, it became evident to me that I wasn't doing enough for my kids. Mm -hmm. And how could I? Wow. It wasn't possible to do what, what, to do all the things because I was so wrapped up in the story of the addiction and the codependency and everything. And so for me, I, I, be, I gained so much respect for my mom in that yeah. moment when I went through it myself and realized how hard that must have been for her. And, yeah. and so, yeah, so the message to her really is just that she's a rock star. Mm -hmm. Our mothers are badasses. I, say <laughs> they are. moms are badass I I yeah she's I feel yeah. like if I could be half the mom that my mom was like she was never there but I knew what she was doing she was always 
figuring it out, like always trying to figure things out. And she always figured it out no matter what, you know? And my mom was instrumental in my recovery. She was, she was instrumental in my recovery because she was always there asking, you know, how I was doing. She always wanted to know what was going on. And she, um, she actually, that, you know, that counselor that I said that I sought for the fix, to fix what was happening in my home and it turned out to be somebody that was helping me. One of the things that he said on that very first day was that it's not about you. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand at all what he was talking about. I didn't understand what he meant. Um, I was angry at that statement. And um, I, but I also knew that he had, that there must be something to it because he was an expert in his field and I, you know, mm-hmm. picked him. <laughs> with a lot of methodical planning. And so the thing that my mom did for me is um, the day that I had that appointment and she called and asked me how it went and I told her what he said. And um, I said, I don't understand what it means, but I know I need to. So can you just call me every day for a couple times a day for the next two weeks? And all I want you to do is just say it to me. It's not about you. Wow. I just know I need to hear that. And she did that for me. She just called me every couple hours for two weeks just to tell me that it's not about me. And that was, that's, that's something that a rock star mother does. Well, they don't, they didn't do anything beyond. They don't do anything less. They just do what you ask. They do what you need. Yep. They do what you ask. I love Absolutely. It. What is the one word or statement that you wish you had a chance to tell your dad? Oh my God, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> Um, hmm. that I wasn't expecting. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I would tell him. Maybe that I'm okay. Mm -hmm. He knows. Yeah. 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 He, um, my dad and I were super, super close. So you know, ending my marriage was partly something that I did with his blessing. What I, mm-hmm. what I wish was that he were here to, to know my current husband. That's what I wish. I wish that he were, he were alive to have met him and to see how good we are together and what a, you know, amazing person that I ended up with. Um, and, and how happy I am. Yeah. And just, you know, that I'm continuing to push myself outside of my comfort zone and um, try new things. And these are all things that my dad and I used to talk about. Um, so that's, that's what I would say to him. And that you're still the hero that you were to him. You know what? I'm the hero sure. for myself. That's, that would be it. I'm the hero. I decided to not look outside for that hero and I became my own hero. Absolutely. What is your message to your husband? Your husband. Oh, he's, um, he's amazing. Just, he's my biggest supporter. And um, I just love that he loves the real me. Like, I don't ever have to pretend to be somebody that I'm not. Um, not and he much. just, oh, it's, it's, it's very, very freeing. And um, yeah, and he's a, and he's such a great dad too, and a great stepdad. Um, awesome. Yeah. If today was your last day, what, what is your last words to your boys? Mm. Last day with them being here before they move and leave me, abandon me. <laughs> um. Abandon you. Yeah, I'm just teasing. Um, you know, I just want them to be proud of who they are and I'm proud of who they are. And just, you know, one of the things that I, that I've shared with both of them is when you find that thing that lights you up, go do it, find a way to keep your hand in it, find a way to make it a career. Don't worry about what other people think, just, Find a way to keep that fire lit inside of you, whatever that thing is that you love. Absolutely. Yeah, I tell my kids the same thing. Like, whatever energizes you and you're just super excited and you can't remove it off your brain, 
yeah. like it just keeps coming back. And <laughs> that's even, if it. it's me, even if I'm the one that's telling you that it's not a great idea, don't listen to the people who are squashing your dreams. And I try really hard not to be that person, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I want them to live a fulfilling life and and not get caught up in compare and despair and keeping up with the Joneses and all of that stuff. Yep. So I know you have a big team in your health coaching business. Mm -hmm. What is your message to your team? Oh my gosh. Um, my, our team, our team name is team brave and bold. Um, and it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's just be you mm. just continue to show up and be yourself and do everything from a place of service um, and you can't go wrong. When you are just show up as yourself and do things from a place of service and genuinely care about the people that you're helping, the rest just falls into place. That's lovely. Pick one story aside from your story amongst your team. And I know team, bold and brave, you're all amazing. So brave and bold. Give Barbie some grace because I'm going to ask her oh. to pick one story. You don't have to name names, but just pick a story that really like would make you cry when you made you cry when you heard their victory story. Mm, um, I would say um, gosh, there's a lot of great stories in there, but Probably, um, I mean, I, it's everyone's going to know who I'm talking about, but my success mm -hmm. partner um, and just how much she has overcome in the last two years um, and just watching her continue to fight for her personal independence um, and overcome limiting beliefs and mm -hmm. stand for who she is and it's, um, it's, it's really quite amazing. It's really, really quite amazing. And I 100% I believe that um, the path that I, ha that I had through life coaching led me down the path to meet her first before becoming a health coach. Mm -hmm. And what a blessing that was to be able to be there for her and watch her grow. Wow. Well, Barbie, thank you so much for your gracefulness. I appreciate you sharing your story and, you know, at times you're vulnerable and you're being honest. I think the honesty that you have and just being able to share those moments that you had through your childhood, through your first marriage is going to make a difference in people's lives who are listening, especially Thank mothers. Um, and I want to commend you for owning the Barbie identity because I think <laughs> that you are Barbie more than Barb. Barb is the past and it doesn't really like if you told me you're Barb, I can't make it click in my brain. So it just doesn't light me up and I just want to do things that light me up. That's all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So thank you for showing up the way that you do because I enjoy watching your progress. Thank you your um, amazing progress that you've done in the past 18 months. So congratulations on all, all of your success. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. I'm so glad that I have, was able to be here. Absolutely. So before I ask you my last question, can you share to the world where they can find you? What is your social media handle and which social media outlet do you usually hang out the most? Yep. Um, I, um, you can find me a couple different places. Um, my website is, is www.desiredlives.com, D-E-S-I-R-E-D-L-I-V-E-S.com. Um, I also have a Facebook page under that same name, as well as an Instagram page, same name. Uh, Instagram is desired, I think, underscore lives. Um, but you'll see me there. My name in big, big letters, Barbie Haven. Instagram is where I hang out the most. Um, but I, I am on all three platforms. Awesome. Last question. Um, when you heard the word mother hustler, what came to your mind and what is Barbie's definition of it? Mm. 
Gosh, I think because I was in the middle of, of really hustling to grow a business and a team, um, and because I'm a mom, what came to mind was the, the willingness to sacrifice um, whatever I needed to sacrifice in order to make things happen for my family. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's getting the job done. It's, it's doing whatever it takes. And I think as moms, we often do whatever it takes. Um, so my definition, I guess, of a mother hustler would be, you know, a mom who isn't necessarily killing it every day because we're not perfect, but we're, she's just showing up. She's showing up over and over and over again for herself and for her children and her no family. Matter how tough, right. No matter how tough. And, you know, and then on those days where it becomes incredibly tough, hopefully she's got a community that she leans on and hopefully she's got a lifeline to people who will remind her of her power and her worth and, um, you know, breathe just a little bit of life back into her so she could keep going again and again. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate you and I'll see you around, Barb. Barb. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karine.